the the improving safety within IndyCar racing. And so much of that came from Tony and from the IRL. And, and, you know, Tony was a huge proponent, pushed that really hard. So you were in the thick of things like the Hans device becoming mandatory, the safer barrier being built, work being done on attenuators, on gearboxes, things like that. That must have been a cool side of the job, having been around the sport for so long, playing such a pivotal role in making it safer for all these drivers that you've worked with or, you know, idolized over the years. It, it really was, James. I think my involvement with and association with the group of people that helped develop the Safer Barrier is by far the thing I'm most proud of of anything I've ever done being involved in this sport. I think it's, I think it's probably the single most impressive and important safety innovation in the history of, of motor racing. I think it's, it's, um, you know, there's been a lot of them, everything from the seatbelt to you know, some of the energy absorbing materials and seats and head surrounds and helmets and Hans and whatnot. But I just think when you look at what the safer barrier has been able to accomplish, it's versatility being able to use with stock cars, Indy cars, you know, and a variety of racetracks, the turn radiuses, the versatility of it and its effectiveness. I'm, I'm really proud to be involved with that group. A pretty small group looking at that. And boy, if you could ever go back and look at the the evolution of what we did on that, we had a little safety committee and Phil Casey and Dr. Henry Bach, John Pierce and myself, and we kind of helped design and move forward with what was initially called the PEDS, which I believe was an acronym for something like the polyethylene energy dissipation system. And if you, you go back and look at that with what we had created, Phil Casey and I first tested that in the inside of the turn four at the speedway. Uh, Phil had gotten a junk car and we took one of the maintenance wreckers and greased up the push bumper on the front of it. And, you know, <laughs> we had IMS Productions put a TV camera up and Phil and I were out there one Saturday morning and we pushed this car and I swear to God, you could do it a thousand times and you'd never do it again. But we had literally got this car, Phil locked the steering on it and I used driving the push truck on it. And we got the thing to hit within about a foot of where we had put an X on the wall and it was it was pretty cool how it worked, but then it ricocheted off and it was heading right over towards the attenuator. <laughs> and we thought, oh, we're going to hit the attenuator with it and tear it up. But we, we quickly realized that it was, you know, something that had a lot of merit to it. And, you know, that's another thing. You go back to Tony, his, his decision making and his guts to put some of that stuff out. We ended up putting that PEDS in the inside wall for an IROC race. And if you remember, Ari Leyendijk hit it with an IROC car in that race. And we didn't have the vision boards around. We don't know, you know, what's going on that much. But I was watching the IROC race from the turn two suites. And I walked over after the crash, they went red flag. And I, I walked over to Foyt suite to see what was going on. And actually, they went red flag. And I, I walked over to Foyt suite to see what was going on. And actually, AJ met me at the front door and he said, I think your wall just saved Landyke's life. And I'm like, oh, great. He goes, but it's all over the racetrack right now because it blew the wall off the attachment points and it's scattered everywhere. So we, we clearly realized we needed some help. University of Nebraska uh, came on board at that point in time and the ongoing development of that project led to where we're at. But again, having never installed it at another racetrack, you go back to Tony's decision where he's at and, and reiterating the emphasis of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway being an area for innovation and design and safety and a leader in those departments for him to make the call to put that on the outside walls for the 2002 Indy 500 having never been on any other racetrack pretty brave decision to make and you know look at look what it's led to it's around everywhere now and been pretty incredible it's amazing the obviously, you know, you, you touched briefly on the development process that it ended up having to go through to get to the product that we have, but to so quickly come up with a universal adaptation of a product that legitimately saves people's lives um, on a regular basis is, is phenomenal. Like that's, it's a rare thing. You know, obviously that's, there's a lot of things that have come out that are similar, but, you know, after decades of, of trying and, and you guys, you know, identified there was a problem, you needed a solution and, and came up with one and relatively very fast periods of time. So James and I, I think, kind of speak from the same cloth in the sense of, you know, obviously it's 
saved James's life. Um, you know, I've had plenty of impacts on ovals and, and it's a, it's an amazing thing that we take for granted as drivers until you're obviously in that situation. But it is, it is something that I talk about every single time when, you know, someone that doesn't know much about the sport comes up to me. It's like, Oh, are you, are you scared of racing or is it scary going that fast? It's like, no. And the reason is yes, the cars are safe, but the tracks are arguably safer. Um, yeah. so I, just, I want to point out, I don't think it's fair to br blame Brian for saving James's life. Like that was obviously <laughs> we're all upset about that. <laughs> I don't think that's Brian's fault. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm right, gonna so, pass on this one. So. Here he comes off the corner. Oh, Whoa, up contact. against the wall. Leyendike goes down, takes the inside wall, and tears that car up. Wow. And it looked like Burton had some pretty heavy left side damage. So coming off at turn four, right at the head of the pit area, yellow comes on, yellow doesn't count. Look at Burton's car. This could mean the end of his day. And I'm not sure that Jeff Gordon didn't have some damage to his car. So there were right there, two of the contenders where the trouble was. Mark Martin was really smart to try and move early and get away from this kind of a situation. Yes, he was, and we can see that Jeff Burton's day is gone severe damage to that car they may be able to get a backup car for him now in terms of repair the IROC crew is good I don't think they're that good they are going to stop the run while they get the track clean here it is Benny ever see Lion Dock in the orange car as he comes off the corner and we see the green car I think that was Kendall that went up and slapped the wall I tell you what, we tested that new wall, didn't we? Sure did. That thing worked there. That's an attenuated barrier. There we see Kendall goes up and smacks the wall. And when he smacks that wall, he comes down and hits the line die car. And he goes down and smashes in that inside wall. And Tony Stewart came right through the debris there after see the accident. There's Kendall. He catches line die. Boy, there's a lot of damage on Ari Leyendijk's car, but I think that barrier on the inside did help the accident substantially. Look at this. Now we'll watch the white car. Watch the damage to Mark Martin's car is, is made by Burton running into the back of him. Let's go to the pits, Jack. Well, Dale Earnhardt had the wherewithal to back up pit road and get service here at the uh, IROC uh, pit area. Dale, you've asked for four tires, but can you take us through what occurred out there coming out of turn four? Well, I see Lion Dyke spin down. I knew he, I knew he was probably coming back across. We started checking up. He came across in front of somebody, and I, I jammed the brakes on his flat spot of the tires, but I run over something to him and busted one of them. So just was trying to miss it. I hope Harry's not hurt. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, we're getting ready to go green after the red flag session. Good news, according to Dr. Henry Bach of the Indianapolis Speedway Medical Center, Ari Leyendijk is awake, he's alert, he's articulate, he's talking, but he might have a slight concussion, so they're going to send him down to Methodist Hospital where they can do a thorough check on him. Now, as the cars begin to roll toward the green, let's look at what set up that situation. There we see the first four cars come off. The green car, Tommy Kendall, goes up and brushes the wall off turn four. He comes down and hits Lion Dyke. He loses control as he tries to dodge Kendall and watch these four cars as they all slam on the brakes and run into each other, trying their best to dodge Lion Dyke. Unfortunately, all the contenders in the championship fight were behind the accident. During the red flag, Jack Root talked with Tom Kendall. Tommy, what happened out there? Well, you know, we were just trying to get settled in. Al Jr. just gotten by me, and, uh, you know, early on in these races, the cars tend to get kind of loose, and so I was trying to just be careful of that, but uh, I got a little bit out of the groove coming off of four and uh, picked up a big push and just skated into the outside wall and uh, tried to keep it up against the wall. Ari, I think, was either behind me, tried to get by, but didn't, and, uh, you know, all hell broke loose at, at that point. So with two of the key contenders, Jeff Burton and Jeff Gordon, actually involved in the accident some way mark martin was able to get through fairly unscathed this is mark martin watch that as he just barely gets by that crash unfortunately though as ari came off the wall 
Jeff Burton found himself in real trouble and had to jump on the brakes during the red flag. He, too, talked with Jack Arruda. Well, Jeff Burton, your car's been shortened up considerably. Your version of what occurred? I don't know what he started spinning, and uh, I don't know what started him spinning. I saw him hit the inside wall, and he hit it so hard that he was coming back across the track. And uh, the only thing I could do to, I thought he was going to come back across, and the only way I could miss him was to just, you know, run wide open and run into, there was stuff all over the track. I knew I was going to run into him. I knew I was going to run into the car in front of me, but I didn't want to hit him. And, um... Uh, so it tore my car all to pieces, but I, I wasn't. Gonna, I didn't want to hit him. He hit hard enough, and his car was tore up pretty bad. So I wanted to make sure I didn't hit him. It wasn't gonna hurt the, the white car. It was Gordon for me to hit him. It wasn't gonna hurt me for me to hit him. And uh, I just, you know, I hope he's okay. And there's the devastation to Ari Leyendijk's car. But since the first race in 1911, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has been the leader in automotive safety and technology under development by the IRL and the University of Nebraska since 1998, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway installed what they call the Safer Barrier in the beginning of May. Safer stands for Steel and Foam Energy Reduction. The goal of the wall is to reduce the impact on the car, which in turn would hopefully lessen the likelihood of a driver getting injured. The Safer Barrier has been installed on the outside of all four corners of the 2.5 mile track. A total of 4,240 feet of the Speedway's permanent outside wall was covered with the energy-absorbing barrier at a cost of $750,000. Brian Barnhart, Vice President of Operations for the Indy Racing League, has been adamant in pointing out that this is not a soft wall. The Safer Barrier is constructed in 20-foot modules. Each module consists of four rectangular steel tubes welded together. Bundles of closed cell polystyrene, which provides much of the system's energy management, are placed between the concrete wall and the steel tubes every 10 feet. Cables connect the steel tubes with the concrete wall. The Safer Barrier got its first real-world test on May 5th when Robbie McGee hit hard into the Turn 3 wall during practice. The IRL was very encouraged after analyzing the data after the McGee crash. The Indy Racing League believes the safer barrier prevented McGee from suffering serious injury. There have been other accidents since McGee's involving the safer barrier, including P.J. Jones, Max Pappas, Alex Barron, and Mark Dismore. And each driver will tell you that the safer barrier has done its job. The month of May will allow the Indy Racing League and their safety engineers to assess the safer barrier system. We know racing will always be dangerous, but the goal of the safer barrier system is to reduce the severity of injuries to the driver in case he comes in contact with the wall. And the safer barrier has been tested here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on race day for the first time by Greg Ray. Jerry Punch? And Bob, the safer barrier did its job. The fact that Greg Ray can walk out and not be able to smile will be able to walk in and talk with us. And Greg, a tough break for you here on lap 29. What happened? Yeah, I'm very disappointed for uh, A.J. Foyt and Harris and EDS and all our sponsors. It's uh, you know, we've had one of those kind of months. We weren't uh, quick enough in qualifying, and uh, we thought we had a good handle on the chassis. But uh, straight at the beginning of the race, the car was pretty neutral, pretty loose, and uh, we were kind of falling back towards the end of the fuel run there. We were picking it up, and going into turn one, uh, the, the car just got away from me. The back of the car went loose right on turn in, and uh, I think I probably did a couple of tank slappers and, uh, and, and thought I could catch it, but uh, it was just too far gone. Well, a tough break for former Indy Racing League champion Greg Ray, who exits here early. 